And what we're going to discover is that the work of the Holy Spirit differed from the Old Testament versus the New Testament. His work differs from what we find in the Old Testament versus what we see in the present time. And so in today's lesson, um, we won't be so much exposed to those differences as we will in our next lesson. Um, if you were to grab your notes in the back, uh, you'll notice that at the top I've put in the parentheses next to our title, The Holy Spirit's Work, Part 1. And uh, we're going to do a couple of messages here in this section, but most of them take place in that third section. And so I would encourage you to be uh, taking notes as we begin to put these truths together in our study on, on pneumatology. If you miss a lesson, uh, I want to mention you can pick up our study on YouTube each of our lessons are building off of themselves, so YouTube's very easy to get to. You just type in Bark River Bible Church. You can also go to Sermon Audio, where the notes um, that you have before you are being uploaded there, if you want to follow along that way. All right. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, you will find that it includes about at least 100 references to the Holy Spirit. And Robert Gromacki made a great observation. He said sometimes it's difficult to determine whether the mention of the word spirit refers to the person of the Holy Spirit or to God's own spiritual essence. Point being, the Holy Spirit is found in the Old Testament. You'll find the Holy Spirit there. He's in the, in the Old Testament. And, and as we study him in the Word of God, we will find that we can actually trace the Holy Spirit and his movements in the Old Testament. Pastor David Thompson pointed out that it is without a doubt an undeniable fact that the Holy Spirit had a unique ministry in the Old Testament. So we find his presence in the Old Testament. We're going to note that in this section as we look, look at the Holy Spirit and his work in the past. Uh, we're going to see that. Um, now, most of the truths that we will look at in relation to the Holy Spirit, they will be in the, the New Testament. That will be in section 3. But we do want to take some time to point this out where we see him in the Old Testament as well. And so we begin with this first truth. And the truth is, as we begin to see his work in the Old Testament, this, that what we will learn about the Holy Spirit from the past will aid us into an accurate understanding of his work and ministry today. What we will learn about the Holy Spirit from the past will aid us into an accurate understanding of his work and ministry today. So uh, this is critical. When we look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, this is critical to understand. It's critical for the believer. It's critical for living a life that's honoring to God, and it's, it's critical for daily living. And again, the reason why there's so much confusion, I believe, on the subject of the Holy Spirit is because there's been a major neglect uh, within the church in America on this study. I mean, simply put, people do not want to carefully study dispensational doctrinal truths. I mean, in this sanctuary here, uh, you guys, you're a rare breed. <laughs> you want to come in early on a Sunday morning to study the Word of God. Uh, that's very rare. Uh, but here we are. This is critical stuff. I'm uh, of the personal persuasion that the word of God is the best counsel that we can receive. I love what the psalmist says in, in Psalm 73. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. You know, People will pay all kinds of money to see a psychiatrist or to get some kind of worldly counsel, but reality is worldly counsel is hollow. When you compare it alongside the living word of God, it's empty. Worldly counsel pales in comparison to the living word of God. And so the task before us, uh, it's a great task. And I'm going to preface the direction of this lesson by stating that this is not meant to be an exhaustive study on the subject. We are going, we are going to see the work of the Holy Spirit, um, but... I could certainly have a lot more lessons <laughs> as I track his movements through the Holy Spirit. So we're getting a glimpse into that. We're seeing, we're seeing this. Um, and so I would recommend in the back we have um, our bibliography that's posted for you as well. And I would encourage you, if you want to do further study, to look at some of those 
those resources that are there. Um, but in our time together today, we're going to study four ways in which the Holy Spirit has worked throughout the course of human history. Four ways in which the Holy Spirit has worked throughout the course of human history. And if you have your notes, you're probably thinking, Pastor Wes, you've only got three ways listed here. That's okay. This is part one. We're going to get to part two next in our next lesson. And in our next lesson, we, we will see that fourth way um, that we have listed for you. And I want to mention, too, that our next lesson is going to be so critical. It's a critical lesson in our understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. And so you're not going to want to miss that lesson, especially as we see the differences between uh, the Holy Spirit's work within mankind uh, in the Old Testament. So if you're not here next Sunday, make sure you pick that up online. So we'll have those those there. But we're going to begin. We're going to look at that first way in which the Holy Spirit has worked through the course of human history. And we come to this first way in which he has worked in the past, the Holy Spirit's work within creation. We've noted this before, but I, I wanted to bring it back up just for a moment. We've, uh, we've studied this uh, aspect of the work of the Holy Spirit in Lesson 4. In fact, it was the first divine work that we had listed in that lesson, which strongly and obviously supports the truth that the Holy Spirit is a member of the Godhead. But we also find that this work is mentioned in the Old Testament, and so that is to be noted as well from the account in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Ryrie makes a great point. He says, the work of the Spirit in creation is not expressly mentioned until after the original creation. Of course, as a member of the Trinity, he participated in the act of original creation. There is no doubt that the scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit played a significant role within creation. If you would, I'd like to ask that you turn with me to the middle of your Bibles, fairly close to the middle of your Bibles. We're going to be in Psalm uh, 33, Psalm 33, verse 6. In this psalm, the people of God, they're instructed to rejoice in the Lord as the creator of the universe. And in verse 6, the Hebrew word that we have for breath is the Hebrew word for spirit. Hebrews, or excuse me, Psalm 33, verse 6, says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. So the Spirit of God plays a role within creation, as we see here in Psalm 104, verse 30. It says this, I have it up here for, for you on the PowerPoint. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Again, this is a reference in the Old Testament to the Holy Spirit's work uh, within creation. And so we've looked at two references in the Old Testament to the Holy Spirit's work within creation, specifically from the book of Psalms. There's also another reference that I want us to look at as well. It's in Isaiah. If you would uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And we'll be in verses 12 through 14, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 14. In those verses, we find the planning and, and the management of the universe, but both of these things are directly connected to the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12 says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure? And weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? Again, when we look at a very at a very clear at very clear verses like these that associate with the Holy Spirit and his work within creation, we can very easily conclude that this would be one of the ways in which the Holy Spirit has worked throughout the course of human history. And this realization, it caused Robert Gromacki to make a very important observation. He, he, he says this, that whenever the Holy Spirit is involved in any activity, there is control, order, purpose, and beauty. There is control, order, purpose, and beauty. And this observation, it's critical. It's a critical observation to understand. We see that his analysis is correct 
when we study something as simple yet complex as creation. But we also see that this observation stands when looking at other works that have been performed by the Holy Spirit from the past. And that leads us to the second way in which the Holy Spirit has worked in the past. And that is, we find the Holy Spirit's work within Revelation. The Holy Spirit's work within Revelation. Now, when I uh, was attending Frontier School of the Bible, there were three key terms that we learned. Three key terms that were critical in my understanding of the Scripture and uh, how it is that we got the Word of God and how God uses His Word today. And so these three key terms, they're very important for the believer to understand and to grasp. And I believe this. I believe that if we can grasp these three key terms, we will grow in, our area, in, in, in the area of discernment as believers in our spiritual lives. And those three key words are this, revelation, inspiration, and illumination. All right, so we're going to kind of, we're going to break that down a bit. Revelation, inspiration, illumination. Those are the three key words there. And we're going to talk about illumination in uh, section three. Right now, we just began section two. Uh, We'll get to illumination later on um, because that is a, a reference to his work today in the present, um, but we see revelation and inspiration as works of the Holy Spirit in the past. Um, And so we're going to, we'll get to illumination here, but revelation is God making known to man what he otherwise could not know. And Ryrie defines uh, revelation. Ryrie says revelation basically means the disclosure of that which was previously known. The source then for revelation is not human. The source for that information that was made known came from God, and so the source is God. And that's so critical to understand when it comes to revelation. It, it comes from, from God himself. Now, when we study pneumatology, we find that the Holy Spirit plays a critical role when it comes to revelation, when it comes to inspiration and illumination, which naturally brings us into two categories that come into play when we talk about the instruments used who would receive this special revelation. And the first category that we've discovered here is the human instrument. We find human instruments are involved within the unfolding of what we call in theology progressive revelation, God revealing information to man over a long course of time, progressive revelation. He would use human instruments. Now, a philosopher is a man who tells us what he thinks. A scientist is a man who tells us what he knows or has discovered. A gossip is one who tells us what he suspects. But a witness is one who tells us what he has seen and heard. And when we open up the Old Testament, we find that the main human instrument that God used who would receive revelation from God was the prophet. In the Old, in in New Testament times, prophets, apostles, and those closely associated with them were the chief main agents or instruments who would receive and communicate revelation. Now, in the, the context of the church universal, when I say church universal, all of uh, the believers, all of those who've placed their faith in Christ, who've been placed into the body of Christ within this, this church age of grace, we find that the church was, as Ephesians 2 tells us, it was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Well, what made the apostles and the prophets so unique was the fact that they received and they communicated direct revelation that came to them from God. But there was a, a major difference between the apostles and prophets in relation to those who don't know God. David, for instance, knew the Lord. Uh, David had a relationship with God, and towards the end of his life, he writes something that I want us to see. If you would turn with me to 2 Samuel, I have you here in Isaiah. We'll go back a bit. We're kind of moving around a a bit here. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2. 2 Samuel chapter 23, 23, verse 2. 2 Samuel 23, verse 2. This is what David says. 
the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. Dwight Pentecost makes a, a, a comment here on that verse. He writes this, The songs that David sang to the praise of God were not of his own origination, but rather it was the Spirit of the Lord who spoke through David, and the Spirit's word was in my tongue. David was so possessed and controlled by the Spirit of God that he made a revelation to David. The word was not David's, but the Spirit's. If you would, turn with me over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, chapter 2. I want us to see this as well. Ezekiel, chapter 2, verse 2. The prophet communicates here that he had been given a message by God. Ezekiel, chapter 2, verse 2. says, As he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. The message that Ezekiel was given did not come to him on his own. It was, it was not given to him by a false prophet or some other way. It was given to him by the Holy Spirit. So again, when it comes to general revelation, we find that the Holy Spirit is the agent in the giving of that divine revelation. So there were human instruments who received that divine revelation. This also leads us to that second category where we find divine instruments. Divine instrument. That's the second category. Since the Holy Spirit is the agent in the giving of divine, or we might say general revelation, we find that he was responsible for the giving of this information. And, and as I mention this point, we should all be able to cite Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21 as a proof text. However, we looked at that verse already in our study on pneumatology, but I also want us to see what we find in the book of Micah, chapter 3, verse 8. We read, on the other hand, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel, even to Israel his sin. So again, we find here his, this work of the Spirit as he would bring information to mankind that he would then take and act upon. So we have here this unique combination. We have the Spirit of God imparting revelation to mankind. And he does so through various methods. You look in the Old Testament. There are various ways in which God communicates to man. All right? You're gonna, we're going to note those different methods here in our time together. Uh, various methods. The first method we, we want to note here is the spoken word. The spoken word. In my opinion, one of the plainest examples of this is in First Samuel chapter 3. You'll remember Samuel is awakened as a child. How was he awakened? The voice of God, right? The voice of God was calling out to him. Here you read, you read that chapter and it becomes clear that God was speaking to the boy in an audible voice. It was a voice that sounded like a man's voice. Ryrie makes a great point here that's worth mentioning. He wrote this, The direct voice of God speaking on these occasions is a vivid reminder that revelation is specific, clear, and in words. When it comes to revelation, note that. It is specific, it's clear, and it's with words. I mean, we saw this point very clearly when we studied the book of Jeremiah. There are all kinds of instances where God had communicated a message to Jeremiah that he was to bring to the people. And the problem was not with Jeremiah or the messages that God had for him, but with the people. They, they didn't want to hear the messages that Jeremiah had uh, from the Lord. In fact, they wanted to have their ears tickled. They wanted to feel good about themselves. Now, I want us to consider this statement here because we might be tempted to ask ourselves uh, why God doesn't communicate in the same way that he did before the scriptures were completed. And this is a statement by Dwight Pentecost that I believe is so helpful. I'm going to read it for you. He says this, God does not use these methods today for the simple reason that revelation has been completed through the person of Jesus Christ and through the inspiration of the scriptures. 
those who have the word of God and those who have received Jesus Christ and the revelations which he gives have all the truth that God has to reveal to man. Men who are still looking for added revelation through visions and dreams and trances are saying, in effect, that God has not made sufficient revelation. I think that's a great point that he has there. Um, I want to reread that, uh, that last little bit there. Men who are still looking for added revelation through visions and dreams and trances are saying, in effect, that God has not made sufficient revelation. It is a dangerous game when God's people start searching after fortune tellers, when God's people start going to astrologers. If you remember back in the book of Daniel, when King Nebuchadnezzar had his disturbing dream in Daniel chapter 2, do you remember what his first course of action was? He called into his presence the magicians, the sorcerers, the conjurers. That's who he was after. Um, and he was disappointed. <laughs> he was disappointed with what they had, um, except for Daniel. Well, what was special about Daniel? Daniel had a relationship with the God of the universe. Um, and God was able to reveal to Daniel what he needed to know. And, and so it's a dangerous game. God's children are wise to heed the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Now this next part is key. Your word is truth. So if you want, wor if you want truth, you go to the word. The second method used in the past was dreams. The second method used was dreams. Now, Ryrie pointed out that generally dreams were not the method used in giving revelation to the prophets, but they were often used in relation to heathen men. And of course, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar from Daniel chapter 2 would be an example of this. We also find another example in Genesis chapter 41 involving the dreams that, uh, the dreams that Pharaoh would have. Uh, God was communicating to Pharaoh there information that he want, wanted him to know about. So revelation would certainly be given at times through the method of dreams. The third method for the giving of revelation would be through visions. It would be through visions. Now the difference between revelation in a dream and revelation through a vision is simply the difference between being asleep and being awake. Um, that's the difference. In the dream, the recipient was in a state of sleep. In the vision, he was in a waking state when God revealed to him uh, certain truths. So there is a difference between those two methods that I want to point out. I just remember years ago while studying the book of Daniel, there were a good number of visions that Daniel received. And so it's uh, also interesting to note what uh, we find in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 14, verse 14, we read, Then the Lord said to me, and Jeremiah is speaking here, The prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. Excuse me, the Lord speaking here to Jeremiah. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. By the way, does this kind of stuff still go on today? It does. It does. According to Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 14, God calls messages that do not come from him, that do not square with revealed revelation from God as the source. He calls those types of messages false. He calls them pagan. And by the way, there are messages that can be given today that are flat out demonic. There are demonic sources out there, and so the child of God needs to be so careful. God calls false messages useless. He calls them deceptive based off of Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 14. So if as God's children, we are to glean anything from these words in, in Jeremiah, it's that we had better listen, listen to things that square with the word of God. And we need to be discerning. We need to be careful. And that brings us to the fourth uh, method in the giving of revelation, and that is trances. We also find that method in the Old Testament. If you remember, in, actually, even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, uh, God gave to Peter uh, a trance there. He had revealed to Peter that the Gentiles were acceptable to him, and, and God revealed this truth to Peter as 
while he was in a trance. This was in Acts chapter 10. And the difference between a trance now, a trance and a vision, is that the vision, in the vision, the recipient received revelation through his own faculties of perception. But in the trance, the recipient of revelation was lifted out of himself into a state of supernatural hearing, seeing, and acting. This happens in Acts chapter 10, verse 9. I'm not going to have you turn there for the sake of time this morning. Uh, But we find that for Peter. So again, we have found that these various methods that have been used by, by God in the unfolding of revelation of mankind have taken place through spoken words, dreams, visions, and trances, and the Holy Spirit would have had a significant role in the giving of that revelation. All right. Well, that brings us to the third way in which we find the Holy Spirit working in the past, and we find the Holy Spirit's work with an inspiration. The Holy Spirit's work with an inspiration. And it's important to know that inspiration does not have to do with the revealing of truth. That would be revelation. Inspiration has to do with the recording of truth that was revealed by the Holy Spirit to men. And if it helps, uh, think about it this way. Revelation, inspiration, they're both processes. These processes were not achieved in a single moment. Why do I say that? Because the Bible uh, was given to us. Progressive revelation didn't come just to Adam in one moment. And then Adam wrote out the scripture. No, it came to mankind over the course of a long period of time. Um, Within the Bible itself, what's amazing to me is that there are no contradictions. There are no contradictions in in the word of God. It's It's a harmonious whole. And so the question then remains, how does a book like the Bible even exist? Well, God was actively involved behind the scenes, and the Holy Spirit played a significant role in the giving of Scripture. The Holy Spirit was actively involved within the process of revelation, and he was also actively involved in the process of inspiration. Now, if you're like me, if you're like me, you're probably, you're a visual learner, I am, and um, I've uh, we had a diagram like this from Frontier School of the Bible. I recreated it for you. Hopefully that, that will help you. But the arrow from God to that man, that man represents prophets and apostles. The arrow from God to the prophets and the, the apostles, that, just think of that as revelation. That's the process of revelation. So again, the Holy Spirit's involved in the process of revealing truth. Then we have this arrow from the prophets and the apostles to the Bible, and that arrow represents the process of inspiration, and the process of inspiration has to do with the recording of that truth. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 is unique. We have a reference to both revelation and inspiration within the first verse of Daniel chapter 7. Now chapter 7 in Daniel is a significant chapter. It's an amazing chapter. You get to the end of that chapter and you're like, how did Daniel know this? How did he know to write down what he wrote down here? Uh, it was, it's a prophetic chapter, but you look at verse 1, and you can turn there if you want. I'm going to read it for you. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a, he saw a dreams and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. And so that would be a process of what? Inspiration or revelation? In in verse 1, Daniel is receiving visions and dreams. Revelation, all right? We have revelation there. God gave Daniel some amazing, accurate truth in Daniel chapter 7. But then the verse goes on to say, Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Now, what is that referring to? That would be inspiration. There, Daniel, he's taking what he has learned, he's writing it out, and we know that the Holy Spirit guided Daniel in that process of recording what he, what had already been revealed to him. This is what Peter writes about in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20, where he says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Well, why not? Because verse 21 would go on to say that the Holy Spirit was the one who guided them to write down what they were given. And so the result then is 
an inspired product. So the process of inspiration happened as the Holy Spirit guided these apostles and prophets to write down what they wrote down. And the finished product is then an accurate, inspired record unlike any other book in the Bible. Two reasons why I believe there's a God. Number one, the nation of Israel. The existence of Israel. Number two, the word of God. When you look at how we got the word of God and you see, you go through it and you see, see the different subjects that the word of, of God addresses in relation to salvation, um, heaven, hell, eternity, those subjects, they are complex. Um, and the, the word of God just addresses it and there is a, there is a harmony there within the word. If you can grasp the process of revelation and the process of inspiration by the Holy Spirit in the giving of an inspired record, this process is going to safeguard you from falling into false religious systems and cults. Dwight Pentecost says that there is no false sect or heretical cult that does not have to depend upon additions to the word of God. And this is so true. I've led a couple of missions trips out to uh, the state of Utah. And uh, there, the majority in that state believe in the Bible that they've added to the Bible by following after what was allegedly revealed to Joseph Smith through those golden plates that he dug up in the hills of New York State. Seventh-day Adventists, they believe the Bible, but they also accept the revelations of Ellen G. White. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses supplement the scripture with the writings of Charles Taze Russell. And it goes on and on in most cases. The false cults begin with the word of God, but they are guilty of relegating it to a place of secondary importance. And that ought to never be the case when it comes to, to the Bible. The claim in the Bible is this. Paul nails it. All scripture is inspired by God. If it has errors or contradictions in it, then we know that it cannot be trusted. I personally have found the exact opposite to be true. I believe the Bible is 100% accurate and that it absolutely holds up to the claims that it makes within itself. Well, as we're, gonna, we're running out of time here, as we close out our time, we have seen some amazing works of the Holy Spirit uh, from the past that have helped us to, in our understanding um, con concerning his power and wisdom as he would be involved in the giving of God's word, I pray that in our time together, we will have recognized just how important it is that we understand some of these foundational truths be because what we will learn about the Holy Spirit from the past will aid us into an accurate understanding of his work and ministry today. This certainly is true for this lesson, and this truth will carry over into our next lessons as we work through this section. We're going to be in it for a bit, and uh, I'm excited uh, for what is to come around the corner. I need to say I'm thankful for his work in the past and for his work in the present as well. Let's pray, and uh, we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we give you praise, and we want to thank you uh, for the work of your Spirit in the giving of revelation, in inspiration, in creation, Father, tremendous to see. Lord, I pray that as we go through the week this week, uh, we would be mindful of uh, his work in the past and thankful uh, for the word that we have before us. I want to thank you for the truth that you've given to us in the person of Jesus Christ, that he would come to this world, that he would take uh, our sin upon himself, that he would die on a cross and would offer new life to any who would believe in him. Father, we give you praise for our salvation. We thank you for this time. In your name I pray, amen.